Hello there, everybody. This is Lucia Palazzi uh, with the podcast Learning 360. And today, my special guest is Miss Anna Gonzalez. She is here uh, today to talk about 504. Now, she's the director for 504 in, here in Galena Park ISD. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? I will. This is my first year as director for 504 and grants. Um, I've been in education 27 years. Uh, in all my years as teacher, AP, administrator, I've always worked with 504. So what do the numbers 504 stand for or refer to anyway? Actually, 504, and it's, ac it's actually Section 504, and it comes from the law. That's the, the name of the law. You go to Section 504, and you're going to find these requirements. And TEA? Or? And TEA, yes. Okay. And, and basically what it, it, what it means is that um, any agency that receives federal funding um, cannot discriminate against any person because of a mental or physical impairment. Okay. So does that mean that, well, private schools, do they get public funding? They may. It depends on okay, the private school. so that would school. depend. All right. Mm -hmm. So who or what um, would qualify under this 504 law? Okay. So specifically, we're talking about education, public education. Any student who has a physical or mental impairment or is known to have a physical or mental impairment qualifies for 504. Okay. So that could be like if I had a broken leg. Would that qualify? If you have a broken leg and your leg will be, you, you will be unable to use uh, that part of your body for six weeks or more, then yes, you would qualify for temporary 504 uh, services. However, in, in most schools, a student with a broken leg is already accommodated by the school nurse, the teacher, and things of that type. Okay. What about if you have a student who is going through depression. Would that be considered 504? It, it could be considered 504. So anytime a, an educator on campus or a parent um, identifies that a student is having difficulty in school due to depression, they can refer the student. We do go through a series of questions um, and we do collect data to try to determine whether or not the student has a need. If during the, the 504 meeting we can answer yes to three questions, and then they can uh, they do qualify for 504 services. Okay, so what would be so those were kind of types of scenarios that would qualify someone for 504 services, but what would be a 504 violation? A 504 a violation occurs when a campus or or, or school district does not identify a student with a physical or mental impairment. And so, for example, the, the, you just gave one of a student with depression. If a teacher notices a student in class and they're not interacting and they're alone and their behavior starts to change and their grades are starting to fail, then this is, this is a situation in which the teacher needs to reach out to the school counselor, the 504 coordinator, to determine if there is something they can do for this child. And I'm glad that you, you <coughs> mentioned you know, where to reach out to. So teachers, yes. the process should be if they are um, concerned about something or there's some red flags going up, some, something's out of the ordinary with one of their students, w the process is they should start with the counselor? Yes, I would suggest the counselor because at that point you don't really know what's going on. Maybe the counselor can give you information about the student. Maybe the counselor has, has been seeing the student and can add additional information. Or based on that information she shares, which will probably be vague, um, <clears throat> then you can go ahead and make the recommendation to the 504 coordinator. Okay, so it's important that everybody on campus should know who their 504 coordinator is. Absolutely. In fact, what we're talking about is uh, what's called in the law is child find. Child find. Child find. And so we are held accountable uh, for identifying those students with possible physical or mental impairments. Okay. Now, another violation, a 504 violation, could be if a student is identified as 504 and the committee has put in place 
instructional accommodations. Mm -hmm. If a teacher or educator does not follow through on those accommodations, it could be a violation as well. Okay, so there's a committee that, that forms. Yes. So how would you prepare for a 504 committee meeting? Okay, so the, the 504 committee can be made up of two or more individuals, d depending on the reason for holding the meeting. But to identify a student initially, you would hold an initial 504 meeting. The 504 coordinator would first um, will first acquire uh, written parental consent. If we do not have written parental consent, we cannot move forward. Once we receive that, the 504 coordinator will collect data such as discipline records, attendance records, uh, report cards. Um, they, the coordinator will send out um, surveys to the student's teachers, to the parent. Um, if the parent does provide medical documentation of a diagnosis, uh, then that will be considered. And so all of that data will be collected. A meeting would be held in which the parent is invited to attend. And anyone with uh, knowledge of that student and a possible impairment would be at that meeting. So for the initial, you may, and let's say it's a student with a severe depression. So for that meeting, you would have the 504 coordinator, the parent, a school counselor and possibly a school nurse depending on um, the experiences the student has had. So the committee meets together, they review all of the documentation that's been brought forth and then the committee has to make a determination as to whether or not the student meets the criteria for 504 services. Now a student can be identified as 504 and not need 504 services. So let's say for example a student who has um, asthma. Okay, um, it could be that the student is taking medication for the asthma and it's maybe during the fall winter months that it becomes more severe. So it could be that during a regular day um, there's nothing in place for that student. During the fall or winter months it could be that there is something put in place to allow the student to go to the nurse for the inhaler, uh, things of that type. Okay, okay. Um does a person need a diagnosis for 504 services? Um, having a medical or physical diagnosis is not necessary for 504. However, it would be very helpful in assisting the committee in determining what the student's needs are. So for example, if the committee is aware that the student is ADHD, uh, they do not have medical documentation from their doctor, but they have been informed by the parent and the student that he has this impairment, then that's enough for us to get the process started. Okay. How is a 504 plan different from an IEP in the SPED realm? Okay. Um, there's similarities and there's differences. Um, I, uh, for I, an IEP, it's an indiv individualized educational plan that's very specific to the student in which um, content, process, and product used by the teacher is being modified. In 504, we're not modifying content. We're not modifying the processes used for the student to complete an assignment. What we're doing is providing him or her uh, accommodations that can even the playing field. Okay. Is there a standard form or template for 504 plans? There is, there actually is, and, and that changes uh, based on what the districts have uh, adopted for their 504 program. Uh, currently for Galena Park ISD, we have a program called Success Ed, and it's a software program in which all 504 coordinators have access to and can complete the documentations required uh, for the process. What rights do parents have if the school wants to change their child's accommodations? The parent should be an active member of the 504 committee. Now, the, uh, the state of Texas and 504 policy or regulations do not indicate that a parent must be in attendance as you would have for special education to have an ORG meeting. However, in my opinion, it's best to inform the parent in advance, give them enough notice to determine whether or not they can uh, attend the meeting, and if they cannot physically be in attendance, they can uh, participate via phone. 
But it's very important for the parents to be aware, to be uh, knowledgeable about what's going on with their student, the services the student is receiving. And at any time the parent feels that their child is not receiving what they believe they should, that parent has the right to go to the school, speak to the principal, 504 coordinator, uh, and, and try to get answers. Can a student have both an IEP and a 504 plan? No, no. So an IEP, uh, I referenced just a few minutes ago, it's an individualized education plan and it's modifying the content for the student based on their academic needs. Uh, so it could be that you have a student that starts off with 504 and um, we've, they've put accommodations in place and after monitoring the student, uh, the teachers, the 504 coordinator do not see growth or progress, then it could be that the student is referred for special education um, evaluation. During that process, the student is, is, uh, remains 504 until the diagnostician, uh, the 504 uh, coordinator, convene to determine whether or not he is in need of additional services. So if, let's say, a student uh, is evaluated for special education services, then at that point, um, we will, uh, the diagnostician will submit a form to our PIMS uh, clerk to change his identification from 504 to, to uh, needing specialized uh, instruction. And how important is that change in PIMS? It's very important because uh, what is entered into PEEBS is actually what is sent or transmitted to TEA uh, for our yearly numbers and accountability. And so if you have errors or mistakes, it's going to throw off the counts. We also receive funding for special education. We do not for 504. However, we want to make sure that those numbers are accurate. Are there 504 plans in college? There are. Uh, from what I am aware of, um, <clears throat> students who are being served under 504 in high school uh, may transfer the accommodation of extra time going into college. Um, they will have to submit this documentation to uh, the college entry uh, department and it's, it depends on the type of accommodations a student has as to whether or not the college can um, <clears throat> provide those same services. However, for extra time, they do. So if we're talking about seniors uh, in high school, um, can a, a 504 student get a transition plan like they could uh, with special ed? Typically, when a student graduates from high school, um, their 504 services ends, okay? Because these are just accommodations. It has not been a modification to what they're learning, what they're exposed to. The only, the only uh, time that, that could follow is if the student is going to a, a junior college or university and they had extra time, then that could transfer over. Okay. Can a school make changes to a student's 504 plan without telling the parent? Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, changes uh, to the student's accommodations or 504 plan cannot be made unless there is a 504 meeting. And so if there's a 504 meeting, the parent has to be informed. Um, changing accommodations without going through that process is a violation of 504. Do 504 plans need to be reviewed at the beginning of each school year, or how does that work? Okay, the 504 plans for students are reviewed annually in our district. The law specifically states that they should, uh, students should have a reevaluation every three years in our district to make sure that we are providing students the best services is to review them annually. So typically, at the end of the school year, uh, the uh, 504 coordinators will go through and mo monitor. However, if a student enrolls in August, then their annual review falls in August of the following year. Okay. So it really does happen throughout the school calendar year, but it is once a year. Now, 
uh, 504 coordinators can request a review meeting with teachers if teachers or parents feel the accommodations in place are not working. So there can be a meeting held at any time through, throughout the school year. However, the parent must be informed. Okay, and I guess my last question is, uh, what what do you foresee as the future with 504? Um, is there anything new that's coming with the law? Is the law changing or is it staying the same? <coughs> um, what I do foresee for 504 um, is an increase in students identified as being dyslexic. Uh, because in 2018, um, the state of Texas and many others um, states um, adopted a new uh, policy and procedures that must be followed. So. Starting in 2018, students in kinder and first grade have to be screened for dyslexia or other related disorders. The law is very specific in that kinder students are screened by the end of the school year and first grade students are screened by January 31st of each year. In addition to that, um, the law also specifies that any seventh grade student who failed the sixth grade reading STAR assessment for the state of Texas at STAR, uh, they must be screened for reading disabilities, which could lead to identification of dyslexia. And so we are in the process of doing that. I think it's a great, a, a great, um, a great opportunity for the state of Texas to identify students who are having difficulties. We may have students who have taken STAR since they were in the third grade and they're in seventh grade and ha have not been successful. That would indicate to me that there's something else that we need to do for that student. So now it's in law. And if you look at research for dyslexia, it does indicate, the research does indicate that the earlier you can identify the student with the reading uh, a disability, the better we can provide them a better foundation as they get older. Ms. Gonzalez, thank you for your time. It's always wonderful sitting down with you and chatting. Come back anytime. You're welcome. I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm.